Hello. The purpose of this presentation is to help you complete the verification of meal benefit applications as simply and easily as possible. My name is David Hartley. I work with the Maine Department of Education Child Nutrition Program. You receive applications and the applications when you receive them are approved based on face value. They record what they say their income is. You use that to make the determination of whether it's approved for free or reduced or whether it's denied. During the verification process, the family has to send you additional income to validate what they say they make. They can send you pay stubs. They can send you tax returns. They can send you a notice from their employer that says how much they make. And this all has to be as current as possible information. For instance, you're doing this in October. You don't want pay stubs from June. You need current pay stubs. Who is not required to complete verification? Are CCIs with no day students? No day students means they're wards of the state and they get automatically free meal benefits. Schools in a milk only program. Those are different and the children in those schools only get milk. Then also school districts that are under provision one, two or three that are not in the base year or community eligibility provision are not required to complete the verification process. Once again, continuing on that theme, who does not to complete verification, when you're submitting your annual CNP sponsor information sheet, you've got the option to select no verification required. You select that button and when you go to the forms tab, on the same application, you will not even see the ability to complete the verification process. So if you are in provision to non-base year, RCCI, no day students, or CEP, make sure you collect, select that button so you will not even see the option to complete the verification process. Verify applications for free and reduced price meals based on the information face value. This session is conducting the verification process with hopefully as little problems as possible. The process should help you keep or possibly even keep or increase free and reduced eligibility numbers. Families may not cooperate because they feel they no longer qualify, but keep in mind once an application has been submitted, the benefit that that application is approved for is good for the year. It's not just the beginning or when they, if something changes. If their, change, if their benefit changes and it becomes better, they can still keep that free or reduced benefit even if their income changes or there's something that changed in their status. Their level of education or disability, embarrassment, language issues. And these are ones that we want you to help as much as possible. Maine is getting more, think more people with language issues. So there might be chances to help them to complete the process. Set up a night, give them a phone number they can call, work with them as much as possible to help them complete this process. What is a school district? A school district relates to the number of school boards within that entity. So for instance, an RSU has one school board, therefore is one district. Most RSUs are made up of more than one town. Those towns make up the RSU. An AOS or a union will have several school boards and therefore several districts within that. Each school within an AOS or a union is a district into itself, unless for the instance, Deer Isle Elementary, Deer Isle High School, those are two schools, but there's one district within that AOS. There's a couple of types of verifications that you complete. 
The first one is standard or error prone, and this was required. We'll get into more explanation of this in a couple of slides. But basically, you're going to ver verify 3% of all of the approved applications. That includes income. That includes categorical food stamp approved applications. And you're going to first, because of as it states here, you're going to select from error prone applications. We'll explain that. Alternate one or random is 3% of all the approved applications completely random. You're not focusing on anything. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. every 10th application, whatever. Somebody giving a number between one and 50. Stuff like that is what would be the alternate one or random. Then you've also got what's called alternate two focused. In this case, you're going to verify or attempt to verify 1% of all of the approved income applications. You're also going to attempt to verify one half percent of the approved food stamp or categorical applications. Air prone application are those that indicate monthly income within $100 or income within $1,200 of the income eligibility limits for free and reduced price meals. This moves either above the free rate, below the free rate, and below the reduced rate. It's only below the reduced rate because you're not gonna verify a denied application. We don't have figures for this relating to weekly, bi-weekly, bi-monthly. So if you pick an application for this, you need to convert it to annual income to determine if it is an error prone application. So here's an example for this school year, the income guidelines for a family of three monthly is 2798. Yearly for a family of three for free is 33,566. For reduced monthly, 3981. For reduced annually, 47,767. So if they fall within these ranges, if it's $100 below 227.98, if it's $100 above 28.98, it's error prone. If it's $100 below 39.81 for reduced, it's error prone. If it's 39.90, it's a denied application. Therefore, not error prone therefore not subject to the verification process. So here's an example, family size of three, income is 3881 monthly. Is this an error prone application? Okay, so it's, it, the answer is yes, because the qualifier is 3981 for free, and it's $100 above, or not the qualifier, it, it's $100 below the qualifier of 3981, so it would be counted as a reduced error prone application. Here's what it looks like. The family has monthly income of 3881. The reduced guideline is 3981. $100 difference, it is, yes, an error prone application. Here's another one family size of three. On here, they stated weekly income is 928. This one would not be considered error prone because the 919 is the reduced guideline. So they're not going to be an error prone because it was reduced. It's only, what, $9 over, but it's over. It's a denied application this application is not subject to the verification process. Error prone application, another application, another sample. So in this case, we're gonna to have to re transfer these amounts, convert these amounts to annual income because there are two different income levels. One of the individuals is paid every two weeks and their income is $735. The other individual is paid twice a month. Their income for that period is $800. So we're gonna take 
for weekly, they get paid every two weeks. That means they get paid 26 times a year. We're going to multiply the 735 by 28 to give us 21,398 for annual income. Twice a month, they're paid 24 times a year. So we're going to multiply the 800 by 24 to give us 25,272. Add these two numbers together, we're going to come up with 46,670 annual income. Don't convert back down to monthly, you're going to leave it at annually. So their annual income is 46,670. The reduced guideline is 47,767, $1,200 difference. And the 46,667 falls between these two numbers. So it is an error prone application. Standard error prone only select 3% of all the approved applications selecting from what is considered an error prone application. Do not over verify. And we're going to take another step later in this presentation to show you how to determine how many applications to verify. Sample size only count approved applications. Only count one application per family. Do not count applications for families that are also on the direct certification list. You're not using the application to give them that benefit. They're getting the benefit because they're on the direct certification list. I skipped a slide, sorry. Selecting standard. Once again, 3% of all free and reduced approved applications, both income and categorical, is determining the size only one application for family, but the standard is also considered error prone. So whatever you come up with, you're going to count the error prone applications, and that's going to be your sample. Not your sample size, your sample. So here's a, for instance, you've got 135 approved applications, both income and categorical. 135 times 3% is 4.05. In the verification process, you will always, always round up. Never round down. So 4.05 becomes 5. So in this sample, you need to verify 5 applications. If you have 10 error-prone applications, then you're going to randomly select 5 of those. They're in a stack, select every other one. If you do not have enough error prone applications available, pull from the remaining stack. For instance, you need five, but you only have four error prone. They're automatic. The last one is randomly selected from all of the approved applications. Could be income or could be categorical. You're not going to focus on any that are close to being determined error prone. If you don't have enough error prone, if you don't have any error prone, you're still going to be conducting the standard, but your sample size is all of the approved applications. If you're manually approving your applications, you have to have what's called a confirmation official. For each selected application that is going to be verified, a school district official, other than the approving official, must conduct a confirmation review of the initial eligibility determined and correct any mistakes by, before attempting to verify the application. That may change it. Maybe it's not error prone. Maybe it's denied. This is what's considered the confirmation official. And this person needs to understand what they're looking at and why and the fact that the information on here is extremely confidential and is not shared, discussed with anyone. The confirming official is a different person from the approving official and the hearing official. So in the approval verification process, you have at least three people. Approving and verification official can be the same official. So in this case, it's Sam Spade. The confirming official, which who must be someone different in this case, is Janet Ivanovich. 
the hearing official who's going to hear is going to be the person who listens to any time a family disapproves or is not sure about what was determined. The hearing official, in this case, is Alfred Hitchcock. This individual could be the superintendent. This individual could be the principal of a school. But you're going to have three different people making this overall process. You don't have to do that if you're using a computer to approve the applications. So if you're using an online application that's been approved, that it's not it's been approved correctly and you don't have to check anything. However, if you're entering data into a system and that's doing the approval, I suggest that you have those confirmed as well. Maybe you misentered some data. I've seen that happening during reviews. So if you're entering data into computer, the computer is still making the determination, still do the confirmation to make sure that the data was entered correctly. Can a district use an alternate method? Yes. If your non-response rate in the previous year is less than 20%, you can use either the alternate method what two or alternate me or alternate method one or alternate method two. However, to do this, you must email David Hartley at main.gov, that's me, and ask to do this. Don't call me because I won't answer that question. I must have a paper trail. You email me, I'll respond yes or no. So basically what happens, what it means for a non-response rate of less than 20%, you had to verify five applications. One of them did not respond. That's 20%. I'd probably say yes. You have four applications to verify. One of them did not respond. That response rate, non-response rate is 25%. You are required to do the error prone verification process. Alternate methods, alternate one, completely random, sampling from all of the approved applications. You're not going to focus on anyone. Well, you know, David's dropped, David cut me off on work today. I'm going to verify his application. No, it's completely random. Alternate two, 1% 1 of approved ap income applications. However, with alternate two, you are going to focus on income error prone then it's also included in error alternate two, one half percent of the categorical or food stamp approved applications. Example alternate one selection, 145 applications, 3%, 45.35, this equals five. 145 divided by, five, divided by five equals 29. Pull every 30th application until you have five. You can do that. Fairly simple method to do. Alternate two, depending on the number of applications needed, this could reduce the number of applications required to be verified. So if you have, say, four or five applic 100 applications, doing alternate two could potentially reduce the number of applications that you have to verify. Keep in mind, to do any of these, you have to get permission from David Hartley, me, to do that. If you're doing this process, you're going, you're starting, you've got your approved application. This happens quite often in a smaller district and you do not have any error prone applications. You're still going to opt to do the error prone. You're going to complete it. There's a spot on the, in CNP web that you're going to tell it you didn't have any. So it's going to take that and move on. If you're going to purposely want to do alternate one or alternate two, that's when you have to get permission to do that. Verification procedures, how are you going to do this? Well, you're going to contact the parents from the applications that have been selected. There is a sample of a household notification for verification on our website. There's verification inf information that's updated that tells them what they can send you to validate their application. 
the Privacy Act statement, both federal and state, must be included on the notice sent to the family that has been selected. Then, when you get the information back, review it, verify it, and see if they're good or if they're denied. We suggest, because you want to give the families a time frame, we suggest you give them 10 calendar days. And when you do that, you want to stick to that time because this can go on. I've seen this going on for two months because the family kept saying, I'll have it next week, I'll have it next week. When you give them a time frame to do this, stick with it. Record keeping. You must keep copies of all correspondence between the families and you. Keep notes of any phone conversations. Must send a final letter closing the process. So no matter what, it's someone in the school, they give you their pay stub. Hi, Sally, you're good to go, thanks. They must get a written notice that, they're, that this is done. You must maintain copies of each individual letter notice sent, not a copy of the master. So you sent a, a letter to the Smith family, to the Jones family, to the Harper family. We come in to do the review. We want to see those original letters sent out. We want to see the final ending statement for those that were supplied, were chosen. You must keep the individual addressed to the family. Household notice of verification, you must include a no-cost telephone number for the household to call should they have questions. Verification, notification, and tracking forms. We have samples on our webpage. Go to the Child Nutrition webpage, select Student Eligibility and Applications, select Verification, and then you'll see sample notices of the information that you need. If you're using an electronic system, Typically, they will automatically print out those letters for you. If they're doing that, make sure you're sending both the correct non-discrimination statements, federal and state. This is just a basic sample of the household notification letter on our webpage. As you can see, you're addressing it to the family. You're giving them the due date, as I mentioned, and stick to that due date. You're gonna say, dear parent of, and you're going to send this to them with the notice that also says what is acceptable for them to send to you. That's what this shows. Unemployment, disability, workers' comp, welfare payments, child support. Child support, remember, with the approving process, child support is only included, alimony included, if you receive it. It does not reduce those paying it. Make sure, as I stated, you're including the current non-discrimination statement, both the federal and the state. Once you've gotten the information, review it. Make a determination if you have enough information to do it. Request more information from the parents if you don't. If no response, make at least one within the first initial time frame you're required to make an additional contact attempt before denying benefits. You can write them another letter. You can email them. You can phone call them. If you're doing a phone call, make sure you record with that application, with that verification notice. I call the Smith family on Monday, October 30th, and ask them to contact me by November 2nd. If that's the case on November 3rd, you're done. This process has ended. You're sticking with your time frames. So when you get past that time frame for the second notice, you're done. Determining pay periods. When reviewing the pay stub, be sure to determine the current pay schedule. Look for the stub to state what the pay period is. Look at the check dates and like if you have two pay stubs, it doesn't say it's for two weeks. It doesn't say 80 hours. But if they got a, pay, a paycheck on October 1st and October 15th, that means they're getting paid every two weeks. If you're not sure and you can't determine it, call and ask. 
once again, make sure you're keeping notes. When you have multiple incomes and different income periods, make sure you're using the correct math to determine it to the annual income. Evaluate the information of food stamp number, check direct certification list. So maybe you've selected, you don't have enough error prone. So you selected a categorical application in your random sample and they have a food stamp number. First thing, check the food stamp, the direct cert list. And that includes searching for the child because there's a method to do that. If they are not on the direct cert list, they will need to send you a letter, a notice from DHHS that they're getting that benefit. Self-employed families will need to send you a tax return. If they have their own business, you're going to use line C or form C, line 30. If they're farmers, you're going to use form F, line 34. Self-employed for verification purposes, self-employed as I mentioned, because that's what tells their income, including their expenses that to, to make that, and what they received to do that. There are certain things not included in this. So that's why you say you're using lines, line 30 from form C and line 34 from form F. If any of those numbers are a minus number, for the verification purpose, it means it equals zero. So for instance, one person in the family has a job outside of the home. Their annual income is $48,531. The other individual has their own job. Just started up a year or two ago, they're still struggling. And according to the line 30 on Form C, they made a negative $25,895. For verification purposes, their total income is 48531 because since the self-income, farm income is zero, is negative, we determine it as a zero. If you get no response, you must make at least one additional attempt. The second attempt, as I stated, can be a phone call. Once again, though, keep specific notes, follow the time frame given, and if you exceed that time frame given by a day, you're done. Close it. Send the final notice. Submit your verification report. We have, once again, as mentioned, sample forms, letter to the parents. A family can self-deny. They send you an email. I'm sorry, I don't qualify. They've responded, so they're not in that non-response rate. The non-response is you haven't heard anything from them. Or they've said, I'll have it next week, I'll have it next week, but you never got it even after a second attempt. That's a non-response. Notify the family of the decision. If the category changed, then the family must be given the opportunity to appeal the decision, and that's included with the notification. Once again, 10 calendar days to appeal the decision. Once a family is selected for verification, they are selected for the year. If a family has been selected for verification in November, they didn't respond. In January, they decide to reapply because they're now paying the Christmas bills. You cannot approve that application until they've met the verification criteria. They have to submit you that documentation to prove the verification that they're using. And you can't do that short term until you get it before any deduction, what is income? Before any deduction such as income taxes, Social Security, main state retirement, insurance benefits, charitable contributions, bonds, cash received on a recurring basis. In-kind benefits are not cash payments, therefore not income. Common questions. Seasonal employment. Maybe for that, you're going to use the tax return. Temporary layoff want to make sure that it's truly going to be temporary. For now, they may be free, but the, the mill closed for two weeks, so that's short term, and they're going to be back to full, full status at a certain point. 
child support payments, once again, if it is paid, it is not deducted. If it is received, it is included. Self-employment, farm income as stated before, use the lines as shown on this. There are various programs that are included and various that are not. Military housing depends on where it's at and what type it is. Excluded federal programs, VISTA, RSVP, foster grandparents, and others under the Domestic Voluntary Service Act, SCORE and ACE, Job Training Partnership Act, land trust payments to certain Indian tribes. There's a manual called the Eligibility Manual for School Meals. It's online. There's a link to it on our webpage. Excellent reference tool. The completion. The completion deadline for this whole process is November 15th. That's when you should be sending out the last notice to say, thank you for responding, you still qualify, or I have not heard from you, so you're now denied. Documentation of dates and communication is very important. As I mentioned, all correspondence must be kept for each individual family. The final results are reported in CNP web. If you, re if you find, hopefully you don't, an old verification report and fill it in and send it to me, I'm going to send it back because you must complete it in the CNP web process. We're going to explain that in a couple of minutes. Once again, keep all records for three years plus the current. And that's what we say for anything in this program. However, if you're in special provision two, the year that you process the applications, you're going to keep those for seven years. The process is good for four years, and then you're going to start the three-year required hold process. So that gives you seven years. Document everything. Records are confidential. Do not mail anything to the DOE Food Service Office unless we request it. Where to get more information, as mentioned, the eligibility guidance from USDA. Verification information, we have that on our website under the student eligibility applications. And when you scroll down, there's a tab for the verification process. And that's where this presentation will be posted. Submission of results. Forms must be submitted online by November 20th. You need to be done by the 15th, and it needs to be submitted by the 20th as mentioned previously, only complete it in CNP web. So here's how we're going to start. So verification, CNP web, you log in, you're going to go to the forms tab. And as you can see in this, there's a verification summary. Nothing's happened here, but you've got that plus sign. You're going to select that plus sign. You're going to then enter data that's going to tell you how many applications you need to verify. So in this instance, they had a lot of error prone. They had 43 error prone applications. On the first line, you're going to put the categorically free approved applications, the number of students and the number of applications those students were on. That does not include the direct cert list. But if it's a categorical number, they're not on the direct cert list, it's included. Income eligibility, that's you're going to approve, you're going to select, enter the same data. You do eight students, four applications, 12 students free income, 12 students, five applications. And then when you hit the submit button for this, you're going to save it, confirm it, and then go to the next page. And that will tell you you've got to certify it, save it. And then when you go to the verification results, remember before, you didn't have that blue X. You didn't have that X to add something. Now you do. You're going to select that. And that's going to tell you, as you can see, the required number of applications to verify. You don't have to do the math. This system, CNP Web, as long as you're entering the correct data, 
will tell you what needs to happen. You've gone through the process, you've sent out the notices, it came back. So in this case, the Smith family did not respond. There was one application, head of household Smith. There was only one student on the application. The original benefits were free. You'll see the drop down button. You're going to say what it originally started as. Then there's another drop down and one of the option is non-response. There's other responses. Those other options stayed the same, changed from reduced to free, free to reduced, changed to denied. So whatever happened, make sure you're selecting the, rest, the correct thing from the drop down. If you did a direct verification, what that means is, for instance, you are trying to verify a categorically approved application. You looked them up on the DC list. Oh, they're on the DC list now. That means that was a direct verification. No one sent you anything. You got it directly from the direct cert list and it approved the benefits and retained the benefit that they originally had. You're going to have to, once you've entered the information for however many applications you have to verify, you're going to check here when all verifications have been entered, and then you're going to have to certify the results. Now, if you had to require, if you were required to do two applications and you entered one, it won't let you do this. It will only let you certify it when you've done both. You've done that, you've completed it. And that's what it'll show you. Everything's been complete. You don't have to worry about that anymore this year. If the auditors ask for a report showing the results of your verification process, you can go to, there's a report on the verification results screen. You can see there, there's an eyeball. That eyeball will show you, print out for them, what they want to see about the verification process. Okay, now here comes the fun part. We have a policy for the verification procedures for missing or late reports, because we track this. I'm going to be checking when they're coming in, checking to see that they've been, the, the entire process has been completed to provide a consistent plan for handling missing or late verification reports submitted to the state agency. Part of our policy, Maine Department of Education Food Nutrition Programs offer training during September. We will have live training later this week. Next, November 5th or within two days, Reminder notices will be sent out about the verification process. This is going to specify anyone that's late. This is just going to be a notice in the Thursday update close to November 5th that says, hey, are you working on this? It's due soon. Actually, we'll probably do that earlier, but we have to do it by November 5th. November 20th, or within two days, the list of SAU's missing verification reports submitted to the team leader or the designee. Reminders are going to be put in the Thursday update very often while we're in the verification process itself. December 1st or within two days, Child Nutrition Service staff will send reminder letters to superintendents of school administrative units without verification reports on file that have been completed. If you've done the first step to tell you how many need to be verified, but you haven't completed any of it, the superintendent's still going to get the notice. December 10th, we're going to send a second reminder letter stating a request for school district hasn't completed the process, starting possible actions. The actions we're going to step, take the next step, will take your ability to complete a claim and put it on hold until something is done about this. That's done on December 15th. If you haven't started or you've not completely approved the verification process, on December 15th, passwords to file claims and to order USDA foods 
will be put on hold. When the SAU's verification report is received and correct, the Child Nutrition Office staff will reinstate passwords and permissions within three days. Typically it's that day, but we say within three days. If a SAU is unable to meet the federal requirement deadline, the superintendent must contact the Department of Education Child Nutrition Services, once again, me, David Harley at Maine.gov, to request a waiver for an extension and that request must include, why is it late? When will you complete this process? And actions that you will take so that this does not happen moving forward. If you request to me, if the superintendent sends me a request for an extension on December 15th, I have to send that request to the New England Regional Office of this program you're still gonna move forward as if you've received that re waiver request so that when we get the answer, you, we send it back, you're already in the process and moving faster to getting this process completed. If you've, re if you've requested an extension and we've left everything open and you tell me you're gonna be done by December 25th, nothing's done. Passwords and IDs will once again be put on hold until it is completed. Not going to be another extension. It's going to be on hold until the verification process has been completed. Verification procedures for missing late reports. Once again, this we will send, including the non-discrimination statement. I know you're not all here. If you have questions, call me, email me, and I will make my best attempt to answer your questions. And if I have questions that I'm not sure, I'll take the information and get back to you. Thank you. Have a good day.